thank you so much. Um, yeah, welcome to Deciphering Coroutines, a visual approach. Um, this is me. Um, you can find me in various places on the web. Um, I'm also one of the uh, co-organizers of the uh, Munich C++ user group. Uh, we're currently uh, still doing uh, online events exclusively because of the pandemic. Um, so if you uh, want to practice a talk, uh, or otherwise want to practice your speaking skills or just want to hang out uh, with uh, some C++ people, um, please check out our events. We're always happy to welcome new faces. Um, in my day job, I'm currently working as a, a runtime engineer for Woven Planet, which is the uh, software spin-off uh, of Toyota. So I'm working uh, with automotive software mostly. Um, so the talk today is about coroutines, uh, and if you've looked at the feature um, C++ 20 coroutines, they're really hard. Um, they allow for extremely complex transformations of control flow, um, which makes them one of the most powerful features that we have in C++ today. Um, but they require use of an arcane syntax that changes some of the fundamental language rules that uh, we're used to. Um, so they're quite hard to understand when you encounter them initially, but what's worse is if you don't use them every day, um, then uh, they're also quite hard to remember, right? Like if, if you get back to them after a couple of months of not using them, chances are you will have to start over from scratch. So the idea behind this talk was to give an introduction that is a little bit more sustainable uh, by giving a few, uh, uh, working into the talk a, a few cues, mainly visual cues, um, that you can then later use to like, if, if you in a couple of weeks want to look at the feature again, that you can quickly get into it, like what was it all about, how does this work? Um, so, uh, a thing to say up front, um, since it's such a complex feature, it's not really possible to introduce everything at once. So this talk really only focuses uh, on like how they work on the language level, mostly how the syntax works and how the different parts play together. Um, if you're more interested in how, um, like what are some of the interesting uh, patterns and facilities that you can build with coroutines, um, then uh, please check out another talk after this one but hopefully with like all the basics that you learned from this talk, then following other coroutine talks is going to be a lot easier. So what are we going to look at today? Um, we'll start by having a very brief look at some of the essential use cases for coroutines. Um, then we will uh, look at the coroutines from the outside perspective, like a caller um, calling a coroutine function. Um, then we'll go through all of the steps that are involved in starting a coroutine. Um, then we will talk about suspend and resume, which is the, the core feature of coroutines. Um, and then we will try to draw like a little map uh, of coroutine land that will help us um, like understand a little bit better uh, how all the different parts interconnect. Um, and lastly, we will use that map to figure out how um, we can interact with coroutines, how we can build some, uh, some simple patterns with them. Um, so a little disclaimer up front. As I mentioned, coroutines are extremely flexible and powerful, and for uh, didactic reasons, uh, I will simplify uh, in places a few things and ignore some of the more advanced features. Um, so yeah, just to keep the explanation streamlined and to be sure that everything still fits in one hour. Um, I think that still what I would consider all of the most important knowledge is there in this talk, so whatever is left out, you should be able to understand that very quickly um, if you work with them yourself. Um, yeah, also please keep in mind that all the code on the slides is very much slide code, so it's meant to illustrate like a specific point, but it's not meant to like be taken at like best practices for how to write coroutine talk, uh, code. So in a nutshell, what are coroutines about? Um, like the, a coroutine is like a function that can be passed in the middle, right? Like imagine like at, at any line in your, in your function, you can just decide, I'm going to play the pause button, return the control back to the caller, and then the caller at any point when they see fit um, can resume the execution of the function. Um, could be from a completely different execution context, could be even from a different thread. Um, so 
in order to be able to do this resumption, um, you need to preserve the surrounding state of the function, right? Like when at, at the point where you suspend, you might have like local variables up in the air. You need to remember where you actually left off, what was active at that point. So all of this state needs to be stored somewhere. Um, so the coroutine is always stateful, right? I mean, at the very least, you need to remember at which point in the function you went into suspension so that you can resume there later. Um, and because of that, they're always stateful, unlike functions, right? A function can be completely pure, no state. You always just call in, and it, uh, the, the result just depends on the arguments. Um, so since the, the interface into a coroutine is still a function, as we will see shortly, um, you should always think of like the coroutine function that you're calling as a factory function that is going to manufacture that state. But then um, all of the interesting stuff is going to happen inside that state. Um, one last thing to mention is the coroutines as they are implemented in uh, C++20 uh, are stackless. That means whenever I go into suspension, I return control to my immediate caller. So I just go one level up the call stack. Um, I cannot like resume a whole bunch of functions on the stack and then um, continue someplace uh, later on unless all of the functions in between are coroutines that like manually suspend to their call. Um, so let's look at some of the essential use cases for where you might want to have such a feature. I, uh, always like to think of two use cases. The first one is asynchronous computation. Um, so let's say you have an, uh, uh, an API, um, like here you want to read some data from a socket, um, and then you want to do that asynchronously since you don't want to block the thread. In the traditional APIs, what you would then need to do is you need to pass a callback to the read function, and whenever your data is ready, um, your callback will get called, um, and execution will resume in there. The problem with that is that like, if you ever worked with su uh, such an API is that it leads to this weird inversion of control flow um, that takes some time getting used to. Um, so you can see that here uh, in that, um, like the error code and the, um, the bytes read, they are being passed um, as uh, parameters to the callback function. Um, but for example, the, um, the socket itself still lives in the function that uh, made the original async read call. So if you then want to trigger another operation on the socket, you somehow have to get that into this callback. Um, and that's, all of that can be done, but it's a bit weird, and if you haven't worked with this before, you might struggle in the beginning a bit before you get into this uh, thinking with callbacks. Um, and the code is also not very nice. So what coroutines allow you to do is basically write the same code that you would have written with the blocking call. Uh, you just like inline do the async read function and it, it, it returns you the error code and the bytes read. Um, but it's asynchronous, right? So at the call wait call, um, it's, uh, it, it doesn't actually go into blocking, but it, uh, it uh, relinquishes control um, and you will get called back by um, whatever your scheduler is once the, the data is ready. Um, so the control flow will look like uh, it, did, it did in the blocking function, but uh, it's actually an asynchronous operation. Um, the other important use case um, is um, if you want to do this uh, stepwise computation. So the, the easiest example there is just like a lazy computation. I'm starting an operation, but I don't want the result right away. I only need it later, and I also only want it to be computed at the point where I actually need it. So in this example, um, just some computation. There's various steps where I provide, provide additional data to the um, computation. I get back some partial results, and like at some point in the end, the whole computation is finished. So these are the, the two main use cases that, um, that you typically see. Um, so let's get a little bit more concrete and look at a really simple example. Um, so let's say you want to write a function that computes the Fibonacci numbers for you. Um, like, if, if you're uh, just doing the, the simplest thing possible, you would probably write something like this, right? Just a, a, an, a, a function that writes the series into a vector and returns you this. Um, 
maybe you, you can think of some disadvantages um, of this function, like why you would not want to do this this way. Um, like for example, with this approach, uh, you always uh, require um, like order of n storage. If you uh, want to compute uh, the n Fibonacci numbers, you need to reserve space for all of them. In scenarios where um, you have algorithms that only need to uh, work on the numbers one after the other, that, that's actually wasteful, right? Because you, in order to carry out your, uh, your operation, you would only need to um, like store one number at a the, at the time and then just go from one to the next. Um, the other problem is that this approach doesn't work well with infinite ranges. Like in case of the Fibonacci series, you will probably run out of precision very quickly. Um, but like just in the general case, um, if, if you're considering an infinite range, um, it might be nice if you just had to decide at a later point actually how far you want to go into this range and not have to fill like a potentially very big vector with numbers. So an alternative approach would be something like this. Um, instead of uh, returning uh, the series into a vector right away, you return a generator object. Um, and that generator object has a next function, and whenever you call the next function, it, heads you, uh, it hands you the next number in the series. Um, so that addresses the, the, the two concerns that we just mentioned. Um, and you probably would all be able to write such a function, even if you've never heard about coroutines. Um, so the interesting uh, question is now actually, if, if you see this, like, is this make Fibonacci generator, is that actually a coroutine? Um, and the answer is, you don't know. You can't tell from the outside. And that's the first important thing to realize about coroutines, um, is that they're an implementation detail. Right? If, if you are calling a function that uses coroutines internally, you don't have to know anything about coroutines. Right? You, you, you can call such a function even from, from C code. Right? You don't care. This is all hidden away in the interface um, of, this, um, of this return type. Um, and basically, whatever, whatever this interface allows, that's, that's the semantics, and whether they implement it with coroutines or by some other mechanism, the caller doesn't really care. Um, and in fact, pretty much everything that you can write with a coroutine, you could also implement without them. It might just be really hard. So let's actually have a look at this, um, at the return type. Um, so the initial call to the coroutine is like a function call, right? It just, it, it does exactly what the signature promises you. You hand it some arguments and you get back an object of this return type. There's nothing special about it, it's just the usual rules. And then the interface of this return type that determines what you can then do later on. So if you understood this interface, that's all you need to know as the, corner, uh, as the caller. Um, so, the um, important thing also to realize here is that this return type, this can be any type. This is a type that we write, that we design. Um, and as you can imagine, because of this, the, if, if a function is a coroutine, that doesn't tell you a lot about what it's doing. It could be doing any number of things. And since the coroutines are such a flexible feature, they actually allow you to solve a, a, a wide variety of problems. So the first thing that you should look at if you want to understand what a coroutine is doing that you find in the code is always look at the return type. And that's the, the first thing that you have to understand. And only after that, like dig deeper into what the implementation is doing. Because otherwise it will be very hard to tell just from the, from the code of the implementation what is going on. So if like the function signature to the caller that that's just following the normal rules of, of C++ and we cannot tell whether it's implemented as a coroutine or not. What actually determines whether a function is a coroutine or just a normal function? So, and the answer to that is really simple. Um, if you have one of these three keywords in the function body, that's what makes it a coroutine. That's, that's the only thing that the compiler looks for and that's, that's the only thing that uh, determines it here. 
And if you have one of these three keywords in the function body, that means that it quite drastically changes some of the rules um, as to how, how this code is interpreted. So you might see some weird stuff going on there that doesn't really make much sense uh, if you're trying to interpret it in the, uh, in the usual language rules. Um, so for instance, very simple example, you cannot use the return keyword uh, in a coroutine function. You have to use the, the, coroutine, uh, the coreturn keyword. Um, but there's, there's also other um, changes as we will shortly see. Um, so as, as a brief teaser uh, for our little Fibonacci generator, this is what the, the body could look like. Um, and you will notice that this is very similar to what an implementation would look like for the naive version that just pushes all the, um, the values into a vector. Um, just instead of the pushback call, we now have at the, uh, at the beginning of the loop here the co-yield call that um, will basically hand uh, the, the values out to the caller. Um, and we will see in the course of this talk uh, what that actually does and, and how that works. Um, and it's no coincidence that this looks like the naive version would look like. Like that's the feature. Because like just printing it, just, just putting it into a vector, that's, that's the simplest code that you, would, that you could write. Uh, and as soon as you need to write a generator, you, you need to restructure the code. And the more complex your algorithm is, the more complex the thing is that you want to do, the harder that gets. Um, and with the coroutines, it just allows you to always write the, the, most, simple, the most simple version. Um, so yeah, in the rest of the talk, we will try to understand what is actually going on in this implementation and how does that work. Um, so like, yeah, like one of the things that you might notice right away is like we have this, we still have this FIBO generator return type here, but you don't see the FIBO generator anywhere in the, in the function body, right? Like in a traditional C function, somebody would instantiate such an object and return that to the caller, and that's not happening here. And that's, that's one of the things that throws people off immediately. Um, so let's, let's take a step back and, and let's actually try to, to figure out like what, what actually is what actually is in a coroutine. And let's try by writing the smallest coroutine possible, the most simple coroutine that we could think of. Um, so this is the simplest one that I could think of. It's just like an empty body, and it needs a co-return statement, um, which returns void, because if I left that off, it would just be a function. But by putting that in, it becomes a coroutine. Um, so the only thing really that uh, that I now need to do to make this compile is implement the return type. So let's just do this and like try to do the most straightforward implementation, just have an empty object for this. Um, and if I try to compile this, um, I will get my first compiler error. Um, in this case, the compiler is probably going to complain uh, that uh, your return type is uh, missing a nested uh, type called promise type that it's looking for. Um, so this type can be provided in, in any shape or form. It could be a type dev, it could be a nested type, right? It just has to be there. Um, all right, then let's, let's try to make the compiler happy and um, just provide a nested type, promise type. Um, and this is now the, um, the second important uh, piece of the puzzle that we, that we look at. That's the, the promise type. Um, so why do we need this one? Um, so if you think like, if, if you hear the name promise, you might think of like the future promise that you know from the thread library. Um, and that's actually not the, the worst analogy here. So if you think of a, a function that computes something asynchronously in a thread and returns you back a future, then the future is the thing that you hand back to the caller so that they can retrieve the result. But the function itself still needs to hold on to something that it can put the result into when it's done computing it, and that's the promise. Um, and it's similar here in a way, in that like the, the return object, that's what we give out to the caller, um, and the promise, that is what remains in the coroutine. Um, the difference is that, unlike with the future promise, the promise is again not a uh, an object that we uh, create on our own and have like a, a, an instance lying around in the function body that we interact with directly. Um, 
But the promise is sort of the central intersection point uh, for the coroutine body and the caller code. And we, we will see shortly um, how exactly that interaction works. Um, it also de determines what happens at essential points in a coroutine's lifetime. Um, so uh, the, um, the promise has all kinds of customization points that allow us to um, inject code that gets executed. Um, at certain um, valid stages of the of the coroutine lifetime, um, like for example, what happens during startup, what happens during completion, what happens uh, when uh, uh, a return statement is reached, what happens when an exception tries to um, to leave the coroutine, stuff like this. Um, so as before, let's just try to implement the promise and see what happens. And if we start with the empty uh, promise type, we will again get a bunch of compiler error messages that were missing uh, a couple of functions that the compiler uh, expects. And this is going to be a, a number of functions now, so bear with me, and if you get too overwhelmed, like, feel, feel free to ask questions and slow me down. Um, so the first thing that it expects is a function called getReturnObject um, that returns an instance of our return type that we had on our coroutine function signature. Um, and that's really what it does, right? So what the compiler does is it looks at the return type. From the return type, it determines what the promise type is. And then it calls this function on the promise type um, to get back the object of the return type that will be returned to the caller. So we are we're making a few jumps here, which makes this confusing, but it's, it's really like somebody has to create this object that we hand back to the caller, and this is the place where this happens. And we find this function by asking the return type, hey, what is actually the promise type for this coroutine? Um, and in this ca uh, case, since we started with a trivial return type, we just default construct it, hand it back, and that's all that's needed to, to make it compile in, the, in this Hello World example. The next thing uh, that uh, the compiler is going to ask for is uh, the return void function. Since we had the, uh, the empty co-return statement, um, that means like we're not going to return a value, um, but the compiler still wants a function that it can call whenever this return point is reached. So, when either the control flow drops off the end of the function or this uh, empty co-return statement is reached, this function will get called and we can do stuff in there. We don't have to do any stuff in there, so we just leave it empty for now, but it has to be there. The other thing is we could always exit a function through an exception. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, the compiler will call the unhandled exception function. Um, and we always need to provide both because like both possibilities could always happen. Um, there's also a function called return value. So if I have a co-return statement that is not empty but tries to return, has like some expression, tries to return some value, then that return value function will get invoked. Um, it works the same as the uh, return void does here. The only difference is that it takes the, um, that it takes a parameter of the value that, was, that I was trying to return. Um, and the two are mutually exclusive. That's why the uh, return value will not show up on this slide. Um, and then there's two more functions that I need to implement, and that's the initial suspend and the final suspend. And we're not going to fully understand yet how they work. Um, it's just that like, the, way the, uh, the way in which those will be called is that the initial suspend will get called basically before the coroutine uh, function body starts executing, and the final suspend will get executed in the very end, basically like after processing the, um, the return void call. Um, and these are just injection points where I can like, uh, introduce additional code um, that, that I would want the compiler to execute at this point. Um, and in, uh, in most cases, you're either going to say suspend always or suspend never there. Um, suspend never uh, basically just means don't do anything, just continue execution. Um, and suspend always means like when you reach this point, 
you don't continue execution. You suspend immediately and hand control back to the caller. Um, and we will see what that does uh, at our, for our small example. Um, so let's say um, I'm, I'm adding a print statement here uh, in, the, um, in the function body now, like the code would compile at this point. Um, and I'm starting out with uh, having the suspend always on the initial suspend call. If I now call the coroutine function, um, the function call will return, but I won't see a print statement. Why won't I see it? Because the compiler will start executing, it will construct the coroutine, but then because on the initial suspend, it's going into suspension right away, it's not going to execute the body. It will pause before entering the body. Um, I will get control back, uh, which means like the, the constructed return type object will get returned to the main function. Um, and since I'm not doing anything with it, that's it, right? Nothing, nothing is happening anymore. Um, in contrast, if instead of saying suspend always up here, I, send suspend, I say suspend never, um, then the function will execute right away um, and I will actually see the, the print on the console. So we've been talking about this suspension now. What, what does that actually mean? Um, and to understand that, we need one, uh, one more piece to the puzzle, and that's the awaitable. So the awaitable, as the name suggests, uh, it's, a time, it's a type that can be awaited on. Uh, and awaited here means you can call co-await uh, on, on an object of that type. So like the operator co-await accepts it as an argument. What does that actually mean? Co-await is an opportunity for suspension, right? So suspension means I hit the pause button, my function stops at this point and I can resume it later. Um, it's not a guaranteed suspension, it's just an opportunity. So at the point where the co-await call happens, the awaitable gets to decide whether it wants to suspend or whether it wants to continue execution. But if it de decides to suspend, then the function is paused and the caller decides how to continue. Um, just like we saw on the promise where we had these injection points for executing code like uh, during startup or on the return or on the exit of the function, uh, the awaitable provides uh, similar customization functions to decide what happens when I co-await uh, at, at a particular point. So let's try to implement the awaitable. So again, I start with an empty type and see what complaints I get. Um, and it's going to expect three functions. Um, the first one is uh, the await ready function, which returns a bool. Um, and that's exactly the point where it's decided whether I'm going to suspend or going to continue execution. Um, so if I'm already ready, then I'm not suspending, I just continue execution. But if I'm saying, no, 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 I'm not ready, um, that means I go into suspension and somebody has to wake me up in the future. Um, if I do say I'm not ready, I want to go into suspension, um, then uh, the function that is going to be called is the await suspend. Um, and as you can see, the await suspend here gets as a parameter this std coroutine handle, uh, which is a type that we haven't seen before. Um, the coroutine handle is like, if you think back to the beginning, we said that um, the, the coroutine is always like a stateful thing, right? It's, it's, we just call a function, but the function is like a factory that creates like the coroutine state that lives somewhere. Think of the coroutine handle as a pointer to that state that stores the coroutine. And it's, it's, like, it's, it's like, it's a handle, it's like a raw pointer. It's not a smart pointer, right? It's really just, I can get to it, but it doesn't have RAII semantics or something like that. Um, and the coroutine handle is actually also what uh, provides the methods for resuming the coroutine, for waking it up again if it has gone to sleep, um, or for destroying it if, if we don't need it anymore and want to reclaim the resources. Um, you can see that uh, the coroutine handle here has the, the, the empty pointy brackets, um, which means it's a template. And um, if you give the, um, the empty brackets, that means it's a, 
It's a type erased coroutine handle. It can point to any coroutine. Um, but you can also give the promise type here. Um, and this is our familiar promise type from before. Um, so um, again, if, if, if you remember, the promise type is determined by the return type of the coroutine. So each coroutine can have a different promise type. Um, and uh, as we will see shortly, um, uh, in, in some cases the handle is all that we have. Um, and then if we, if we know the promise type, then we can, receive, uh, we can retrieve certain information from the handle that is specific to coroutines that are using this promise type. Um, other than that, again, this is a, a normal function. We can do everything in there that we could do uh, in a function. Usually the main thing that you want to do is store away um, the handle type somewhere, but you can do anything that you want in there, really. Um, now there's one last function that we're missing, and that's the await resume. Um, and that is simply when our coroutine gets woken up again after suspension, right? So once await suspend finishes executing, uh, the compiler will pause our coroutine and hand the control back to the caller. And then at some point in the future, um, the caller will resume our coroutine through some means, probably by calling like some member function on the return object that will then like resume the function through the coroutine handle. And then immediately before the function resumes executing, um, this await resume function will get called and we will have the opportunity to um, uh, execute some additional code. And we will also see a, sh a use case for that shortly. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's really the, the simplest possible awaitable that you could have. Um, it just, so this is, this is an implementation of the suspend always. Um, it simply says it's never ready, right? Ready is always false, which means it, it always w wants to go into suspension. Um, and the other two functions are just empty because we don't need to do anything. The compiler will just suspend us automatically. Um, and you can probably guess already what the suspend never looks like. Um, it's the same, it, it's just the, it, it just returns true in the await ready. And now we've seen all of the parts once. We, we still don't un have a good understanding for how they interact, but we've all, we've seen them. Um, and uh, I tried to um, like summarize again uh, in, in a little flow diagram all of the steps uh, that we had, it's quite a lot. So I don't, I don't expect you to remember all of this, but the idea is that like, you, can, you can look it up if you actually want to, um, uh, if you actually want to start writing your own coroutine. Um, and so this is the, um, the, the flow chart for, uh, for starting. I made a similar flow chart for stopping. Um, and you might notice I did not bother to make them very pretty, that is, <laughs> because I think this is actually not the most convenient way uh, to, um, to write this down. Um, I actually like to write it down in, in this way, which is um, also um, how, you would, how you would write the code when you start implementing this in a second. Um, and uh, you can just read this from one line after the other, and you will get roughly the flow of what happens. So first the compiler looks for the return type, and there's one detail which I didn't mention before. Um, if the return type itself does not give the promise type, you can also um, go through the STD coroutine traits class um, to, uh, to point out the promise type. That is important, for example, if you have a function that just returns an int or even returns void. You can still turn that into a coroutine. It's now just that the coroutine traits needs to tell you the promise type since you don't have a return type that can do it. Um, so from the return type, you figure out the promise type. Um, the promise type gets constructed. That's the first thing that happens. And it gets passed as the constructor arguments, the function arguments that you passed to the coroutine function in the beginning. You don't have to accept them here. You can also just have a default constructor that will work. But if you want to pass those arguments to the promise, that's, that's how you do that. Um, after that, it will call the initial suspend call, which will re return an evadable, which mostly is either suspend always or sus suspend never. And after that, your coroutine is started. 
Um, and then the functions that you need to uh, implement for the shutdown is the functions that handle the return, uh, the functions that handle the exception, in case that you, you leave through an exception, and then the final suspend and last. There was a question. Yeah, in, in which cases would I use the suspend never? Uh, so, like, if you think of the initial suspend, um, you, uh, like, one situation that you could have is you want to say, I want to do everything lazy, right? It's just like, I just get back the coroutine and somebody else decides, decides at some later point when to start computation. The other point could be that, like, if you think of the asynchronous I.O., for example, where you want to read from a socket, it's like you want to say, oh yeah, it's okay, like you can start reading from the socket, but I, I will call you back when, when I want to get the result actually. So in this second case, you want the coroutine to actually start executing until it reaches this point where it makes sense to suspend. Um, and in that case, you would just say like suspend never, and then uh, at the point where you do the read call, that's where you do the first call wait and where you go to sleep. Is there a threat behind the scene? That's, it could be, but you don't have to have a threat. So that's, that, that's the thing that they are very powerful. So with the coroutine itself, it's once it goes to sleep, you have the return object, and you can pass that return object anywhere around in your program, and anybody who gets the return object can wake up the coroutine. So you could pass that to a scheduler, and then the scheduler, at some point when like, some result becomes ready, then it automatically wakes up the coroutine on a worker thread. Or it could also be like just one thread, and you, just, like, you, you have a convenient point where you want to wake it up yourself. Exactly. You, you have control where, where it happens. Yeah. Another question? Okay, so um, the, the, the promise type gets the same arguments as the function, so what happens there with move semantics? Um, basically, the, um, the same as with, uh, with any other function. So it's like if, if you can, um, if, if, you have, if you have like forwarding references, you, you, can, you can get moves all the way. Um, but there is the thing that, um, so the, the, the coroutine also needs to uh, make a, uh, make a copy of the function arguments as part of its state. So you have, you have to be careful that the compiler doesn't make a copy there, but it's, it's possible to do everything without copies if you want to. It's just a bit tricky. Yeah. All right, one more question, please. Uh, okay, so the, the question is uh, like how, 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 many, how many states can I have? So it's basically like, think of it really for, for each coroutine, uh, uh, an, an object of this class will get instantiated, right? So each, like if, if, you, have, if, if you have the same coroutine and, and you, or you have like two different coroutines that use the same return and promise type, um, they will both end up in the same type, but they will all have distinct instances of the objects, right? Each will have its own return type, its own promise type instantiated as part of its coroutine frame. So it's like if, if you think back of the beginning, uh, of the example in the beginning, where you have the, the make function that, that returns the, the generator class. It's just like this, right? You, you have one generator class for the, for the Fibonacci numbers, but each time you call the make function, it, it creates a new instance of this class. So it's, it's, it's like a factory, right? It's distinct instances and they, they don't overlap besides that they have the same type. So it's like the caller invoking the state yeah. function. Exactly. So the, the caller, like, it, it doesn't, like, usually it's the caller. Since they're so flexible, it could, could also be someone else. But yeah, like some external entity holds on to the, to the state. Yeah. Yeah. One more question. Mm 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So th that's that's true. Like in, in in particular, like since when the, the coroutine might be suspended and might be woken up in a completely different context, um, if I capture references somehow in the coroutine, then by the time that the coroutine wakes up again, they might become dangling. That that's actually a a, a mistake to to watch out for. All right. Um, then I have a similar cheat sheet for the um, for the awaitable, um, which I think is yeah, it's it's a lot simpler since it's just these these three functions, uh, and I, I think they're uh, it's it's pretty obvious at at what point they get invoked. So now we've seen all of the key components once, even though we, we we're still missing some some links how they how they interact together. So we have the return type, uh, which is what gets passed back to the caller, which basically determines the interface of what we can do with the coroutine. We have the promise type, which has all of these customizations uh, for, for starting and stopping, and can also store some additional state. And we have the awaitable, which um, basically comes, comes into place whenever we do a co-await call in the, in the body of the coroutine. And then we have the coroutine handle, which is like a pointer um, to the coroutine state. Um, so now the key question is, how do we actually resume, right? Like, suspension is easy. I just call call wait and the function goes to sleep, but how do I wake it up again? Um, so what I want to do now is if I go back to my example from earlier, I want to suspend in the beginning. The call doesn't print anything, but then at some later point, I want to call resume on the return object, and that's when I want to get the print message. How can I do this? Um, and the reason why this question is so hard to answer is because we have now all these different parts floating around, but they're largely disconnected. Um, so we know that the caller has access to the return type, right? Because that's, that's what gets returned from the coroutine. That's the one thing that the caller holds on to. Um, and we also know that the coroutine has access to the awaitable, right? Because the awaitable, that's what I write on the line where I do the co await, so that's inside the coroutine, so those, those connections I know. Um, there's another connection that's pretty easy to figure out. Um, if I look at the interface for the coroutine handle, um, uh, I will actually find like a static member function there uh, that allows me to construct the coroutine handle from a promise, um, and uh, a non static member function that allows me to get the promise from a coroutine handle. So those two are you can think of them as being interchangeable. If you have the promise, you can get to the coroutine handle and vice versa. So that's good. Um, now, what I would need to do um, in order to resume the coroutine is I would need from the caller to somehow get to the coroutine handle. Because the coroutine handle has a resume function, and if I call that, then the execution resumes in the coroutine. So I need to somehow make that connection. And um, if you think carefully, we, we've already seen the point where that connection happens. Um, and that's here. Because um, if, if you remember back, the return object gets constructed by this get return object function in the promise type. And as we've just seen on the last slide, the promise type is basically like the handle. They're interchangeable. I can always get from one to the next. So, if I now say inside the get return object function, um, I just retrieve the coroutine handle from the promise, like the this pointer in this case, um, and then I can just pass this handle on to the return type, right? Because I'm, I'm constructing the return type, that's the whole, the whole point of this function. So I'm just going to pass it as a constructor argument, and then in the return type, I'm just going to store it as a member. And now, 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 I've, now I've made the connection. Now the, um, the return object knows the coroutine handle. And I'll let you stare at this for a minute because it's, it's a bit to swallow. So once we have, once we have done it like this, and that's, that's a typical pattern, like you don't have to do it like this, but I would say 90% of the cases you do it like this. Um, 
Now you have a connection from the return object to the coroutine handle, because you stored the handle as a member. Um, and now the, the only odd one out is the awaitable. Um, and if you think back, the, the point where the awaitable intersects with the rest is on the await suspend function. Because the await suspend function gets past the coroutine handle to the coroutine that is about to be suspended as an argument. Um, and uh, if I don't take the, uh, the type erased version, but the, uh, the version with the concrete promise type, the promise shows up right here. Um, and with that, we have the complete map. Now we, we have all the connections. Um, and we will see uh, now in a few examples how that actually helps us uh, like solve real problems. So there's two things that I find are like essential that, that you need to understand. And once you've understood those two things, all of the more complicated things you can figure out on your own. And that is, how do you pass data from a caller into the coroutine? Um, and the, the second thing is like the other way around. Like if I have some data available in the coroutine and I want to pass that back out. Um, so let's, let's try the, um, the first direction. How can we get data out of a coroutine? So we look at our map, we start inside the coroutine. The only place where we can go from the coroutine is to the awaitable. So it has to look some, something like this. If I want, like what I want to do in this case, the coroutine computed the value 42 and that's what I want to pass out back to the caller. Um, so the awaitable is the only choice that I have. So yeah, I have to pass 42 to the awaitable. Um, and the only place where I can do that is through the constructor. So, I change my uh, awaitable so that it takes uh, the, an integer argument and then it stores that inside the awaitable. So now my value lives in the awaitable. From here, the only th place that I can go is to the coroutine handle. Um, and from the coroutine handle, I can get to the promise. So as we've seen before, the await suspend function on the awaitable, that's what will get called by the compiler when I call the co-await. Um, and inside there, I have access to the handle, and from the handle, I can get to the promise. So what I now do is I create a second member variable inside the promise, and now inside the await suspend function, I copy the value that I stored in the member variable of the awaitable, and I copy that into the promise. And now the value lives in the promise. And now to get it out again, I just need to get from the other side, from the caller side, I need to get to the promise. Um, and the only way that I can do that is through the return type. Um, so what I'm doing is like, okay, the coroutine uh, uh, computes this value um, and I want to retrieve that somehow from the return object. So I add a get answer method um, to, my, to my interface of the return type. Um, and as we've seen before, um, the handle was stored as a member variable in the constructor of the return type, right? It was passed there by the get return object function. So when the user now calls get answer, that function can access the handle since it has that stored. From the handle, it can get to the promise. And the promise has this member variable where we stored the value before in when we were uh, on the other path from, from the coroutine. And that is, that is how we get the data out. And um, this, this is a lot of steps to go to, but um, if you have this picture, I, I, I think it helps a lot because that, 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 that gives you some idea of, of, of where the connections are and how the data actually flows from one side to the next. Um, so let's try the other side now. Um, so I want to get data from the caller into the coroutine. And if we look at the picture again, like the, the central point is, is always the promise. That's, that's the intersection point. That's where we both sides meet. Um, so 
getting data into a core routine looks like this. I have the, the call wait call that suspends, and then when the function resumes execution, the, uh, the call wait operator returns a value, and the value that is returned there at that point, that's the value that was provided down there in the main where I called provide 42. So F1 starts executing, it gets to the co-wait outside answer call. At that point, it, it stops executing, it pauses, control goes back to the main function. The main function calls provide 42, and then the function resumes execution, the co-wait call returns, and its return value is the 42 that we passed in at the bottom. Um, so, how does this provide function look like? Uh, as we've seen, like we again need to need to get from the caller to the promise, um, and we can do that since the return type has the handle as a member. So, yeah, we just go again as as we did uh, in the example before. Uh, we just store it in the promise, and the only thing that is added now, now we also call resume on the handle, because we, we want the, the coroutine to continue execution. Uh, we don't have to do that inside the provide method, we could also have a, a separate method that does the, the resumption, but this is a small example, so we do it right here. Question. Please. Yeah. Yeah, the, the promise is the central piece in both directions. But it's... Um, hmm? the, the promise can be said, yeah, because like the, the, where I store it in the promise, like this, uh, this dot value where I store it, that, that's just a normal member variable, right? And I, I can, the, the, the promise is just an object. And I can, I can call functions on it whenever I want, and I can, I can set its member variables however I want. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's not like a future promise in, in this case. Yeah, yeah. That's, but, but yeah, that's an important distinction. That's where the analogy breaks down. Yeah. One more question. Uh, which one? This one? This one? This one? The one inside the coroutine, this one? No? Number 50. Uh, okay, yeah. The outside answer, how does it access the problem? That, that's the side that we're getting to now. <laughs> yeah. Your call stack. Exactly, yeah, so it's like, yeah, so when, when provide is called, um, you will have main on the call stack, um, then you will have provide on the call stack, provide will invoke the resume, and then under the resume, the, you will have the, the coroutine on the call stack, so yeah. Adi? Five minutes, Five minutes. yeah, I'm, I'm almost done. <laughs> uh, so the only thing that was missing was how we get it out of the... Uh, this side, how, how do we get it out on the other side? And it's, it's basically again, so the path has to go through the awaitable, um, and uh, the only place how the awaitable can get to anywhere is through the await suspend function. So in the await suspend function, I store the handle in the member variable of the awaitable. Um, I need to store it because in the wait suspend, I cannot do anything. I haven't received the result yet, right? So I just store the handle. But then when I'm woken up in the await resume function, now I use the stored handle to get to the promise and to retrieve the result that the other side put into the promise. That's, that's how you get it out. So the, the, the thing that we were missing before is that the um, return value of the await resume here, that is also um, the return value that will fall out of the co-await call um, on, on the coroutine side. That's the thing that I didn't mention before. Um, but yeah, that's, that, that's what makes the connection here. Um, 
Any questions about that? Yes. Exactly. A await suspend is, so everything on the awaitable will be executed in the context of the coroutine. Um, and yeah, the await suspend, that is what, when I do the co-await call before I go to sleep, I execute await suspend. Um, and await resume is, is the other side, like just before I wake up and continue execution, await resume is called. Yeah. All right. Um, then there's two more things that I want to mention really briefly, which are uh, sort of, uh, yeah, like additional features. The one is um, yielding values. Um, so with what we've just seen, we could write our uh, Fibonacci generator like this, um, where I do a co-await and then I have an awaitable, which I call like the new number awaitable, and that's how my result gets out. Um, but what we saw in the example in the beginning is, um, that, that I was using co-yield for this. So what, what is this co-yield thing? Um, and really, like, think of co-yield as syntactic sugar, um, because in the end, this is exactly what happens. Um, it's just that uh, the co-yield, um, like, hides the, the fact that the new number awaitable is the awaitable that's being used. Um, and to implement that, um, there's a function on the promise type that we didn't look at before, which is called yield value. Um, and that basically tells you, okay, if you co-yield an int, then this is the awaitable that you give out to the co-await call. But that's, that's like really, that, that's like a really thin layer. So it, it should be straightforward if you understood um, the other thing. Um, and then the very last thing that I want to mention is uh, symmetric transfer. Uh, and I'm going to do that really quick. Um, so normally when you go into suspension, you always hand control back to the caller, right? So the guy that, that called either the coroutine construction or they called the, the resume function uh, on the coroutine handle, that's who gets the control back when I, go, when I go into suspension. What you can also do is if on the await suspend function you do not return void, but you instead return a coroutine handle, you can instead give control back to another coroutine. So you can have like one coroutine suspends and passes control to another coroutine instead of back to the caller. And that's, you, you can build really interesting execution patterns with this. Um, and I'm not going to go into any detail because it's, it's really exciting, but we, we don't have much time. But this is how you do it. It's just changing the return value on the, on the await suspend. So really powerful thing, really simple to do. Um, and this is all you need. This, this was like a, a lightning speed tour through the syntax. Now, now you understood all the basics, and hopefully with this, when you sit in another coroutine talk that talks about like some more interesting stuff, because this was just the boring stuff. All the interesting stuff is what you can now do this, with this. What, what are the execution flow patterns that you can build? What are the libraries that you can build? And this was also the easy part, right? The other part, that's, that's where it gets really hard and where your brain really starts uh, starts jumping, but hopefully like this will help you. Um, and hopefully like with these little cheat sheets, if you now want to start implementing this or like have some code that you want to read, um, that will make that easier. So again, here, this is the one that you just read from top to the bottom. If you want to write your own core routine from scratch, this is everything that needs to get into the waitable. And I think this, this one is really the, the, the money maker. This is how, how everything connects if you want to pass data around. Um, and yeah, that's it. Here's some references for you. And uh, we have like one minute left for questions if anybody has one. <laughs> yes, please. Where's the awaitable stored? So the, the awaitable is like a local variable inside the coroutine, right? It's, it's an object that gets created and then gets passed to the co -await. So. The same as all the other local variables in the coroutine, it lives in this magical coroutine frame that the compiler generates. So like this, this where all of the state of the function lives, that, that's where also the awaitable lives. Yeah. Um, and with that, we're on time. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>